Today I'm going to tell you everything I've learned about shooting new 55 film while enjoying a rye whiskey from Kentucky. Welcome to another installment of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver, and this video is a follow-up to my most recent on location where I went out and shot New 55 film for the very first time. I've learned a lot about this film since then, which I'm going to relay to you in this video. And I even got a couple of new pictures for you. But before we get into it, uh, let me tell you what I'm enjoying here. This is a rye whiskey from the Willett Distillery in Kentucky. It's their family estate small batch rye aged four years in white oak barrels. I'll be honest with you, I bought this whiskey because of the label. Uh, I saw this rad like family crest on it and I said, you know what, I bet whatever's in that glass tastes pretty good. I was actually shopping for a friend of mine. Uh, this is a gift. But then I looked up the reviews and they were so good, I said, you know what, I gotta get myself a bottle. And I'm glad I did because the uh, I'm happy to say the label was pretty representative of how good the whiskey is inside. Um, this is one of my favorite rye whiskeys. You know, uh, I, I love Whistle Pig, for instance. That's a really, really good rye whiskey. This is up there, man. This is really tasty. And um, this is kind of the, uh, the rye whiskey I reach for when I want something at the upper end of good. Like, like almost special occasion whiskey. Almost the ultra expensive top shelf stuff. It's right up there. But I don't want to break the bank. That's when I reach for Willet. This thing cost, I think, $60, maybe $50. Um, I don't quite remember. But um, the point is, in terms of uh, ratio of cost to quality, it's worth every penny. Uh, it's not super expensive, and it's really, really good. As for... Um, you know, taste, mouthfeel, all that good stuff. It starts off with a bit of spice. It's a very interesting uh, flavor. And then it finishes with just a little bit of sweetness. That's what I like about it. Every sip you take, it just finishes it off with a little topping of a little bit of sweetness um, to leave you feeling good. I, of course, prefer drinking it neat like this. And it is a bit of all right. So I recommend getting yourself some Willet four-year aged rye whiskey. Now, let's talk about New 55. So um, if you saw the video, you know that I ran into a few speed bumps. Um, mainly my own rookie mistakes, leaving the shutter open, forgetting to pull the dark slide out, things like that. So um, I'm happy to say I don't think I'll be making those mistakes again anytime soon. Uh, I learned my lesson, I'm a quick learner, and also I'm feeling much more comfortable with this film, so uh, that means I'll be less likely to, to miss steps. I also blame it on the fact that I was making a video at the time, so I was operating a video camera, and that, um, I don't know, everything combined just kind of tapped out my brain. Um, but the other issue I ran into is my prints just weren't coming out like I hoped. They're coming out kind of bright, super contrasty, the highlights blown out, just wasn't happy with them. Now, after releasing the video, uh, a lot of people chimed in in the comments explaining what they thought went wrong, like why my prints were coming out uh, looking this way. Um, and just quick side note, I love that. That's awesome. Thanks to everyone who chimed in. This is one of the many things I love about the film photography community is uh, it tends to be supportive. People want to help each other, explain things to each other, make them better. Um, it's not super competitive like other parts of the photography community. So I love that, and thanks to everyone who chimed in. But not only that, uh, Sam Heiser over at New 55, uh, the main man over at New 55, actually sent me an email explaining what happened, um, offering some uh, bits of advice that uh, would help me in the future. And he was even nice enough to take some time out of his busy day to get on a Skype call with me and explain some pointers, which I'm gonna be relaying to you. Um, so, I did figure out why my prints are not coming out like I hoped, and we'll get to that. But first, I wanna go over those, uh, those kind of simple, easy tips that Sam gave me that might help you if you're planning on shooting new 55 anytime soon. Um, the first tip, 
Real simple, easy one. Carry a metallic Sharpie with you, either a gold or silver one. Um, it's great for marking up your, uh, your film after it's been exposed. You can mark it as exposed so you don't accidentally develop an unexposed sheet, especially if you're bringing it back to the lab uh, later for developing. You can write your settings, you know, four seconds at F13. You can write subject matter. It's a good way to mark these things up. So just carry a metallic Sharpie with you. Um, second thing he pointed out was uh, the handling of the film in general. So he kind of noticed that I was being a little, a little careful uh, when I was handling the film, which I was, because I'll be honest, I was scared. I was afraid of like messing up the film somehow, breaking the developer packet, accidentally separating parts of it that shouldn't be separated. So I was like delicately handling it by the edges and all that kind of stuff. Um, Sam told me, you know, you can just, you can grab it uh, right on the, on the packet here and not, you don't have to worry about damaging it. You just want to be careful around where the developer pack is, which is right about here. So don't smash there, don't squeeze there, but everywhere else, it's fine. It's tough, it's meant to be used, and you're not gonna break it. And that's good to know, because by handling the edges so carefully like I was, I could have actually set myself up for disaster. Because by just grabbing the edges, I could have potentially separated the dark slide from the, the interior parts inadvertently. But if you grab, you know, right here, you grab right here, you're keeping things together, you're not gonna separate parts, and the film can handle it, you're not gonna damage it. So that was another good tip. Um, on similar note, he also told me, I can actually manhandle the uh, film holder a little more than I was. So like when I was putting this into my uh, camera, I was being pretty careful, like very delicately separating the compression plate and kind of sliding it in. And then when I was pulling it out, I was kind of very carefully pulling the compression plate and trying to inch it out. He told me, he's like, you can be rougher than that. Just lean it back, pull it out. It's that simple. So when it's in there, um, it goes in easy, just like that. And then when you want to pull it out, just lean it back a couple of degrees, slide it out. That easy. So that was helpful. Um, now, it's still, still, of course, I'm careful to not screw up my composition or my focus or anything like that. But it's good to know that this stuff's meant to be used. It's meant to be handled. And you're really not going to break stuff as much as I kind of felt like I would. Um, also, if you saw the video, you may have seen uh, in the first frame, uh, I pulled the dark slide too far. I kept pulling it out. And that's because I didn't pay attention to the white mark. That's on me. But Sam also told me that they're working on improving the stop. Um, so when you pull the dark slide out, it's going to be a more abrupt stop. Uh, he actually showed me a prototype. He, he put it in, pulled the dark slide out, and then he just held the dark slide and let the thing dangle underneath. So the whole weight of the holder was on the dark slide and it wasn't pulling out. So they're working on that. Um, again, it was my mistake for not seeing the white mark, but it's good to know they're, they're improving it constantly and they're making sure that that stop is going to be nice and abrupt. Um, so that's cool. Um, also, the prints, um, you should coat them afterwards because uh, they will fade if they don't have a protective coating on them. Um, New 55 recommends this uh, varnish lacquer that you can get at like Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, I went and checked it out. I didn't go that route because it's actually a gloss finish, which I like the matte look of these Polaroid prints. So I went to my local craft store and just got this uh, Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X Ultra Cover Matte Clear um, Protectant. It's a UV resistant uh, coating. It's meant to cover artwork and stuff like that. Hopefully this is as good. I don't know if it's as protective, but I'm hoping it's better than nothing. And it's got a nice good matte finish. So I just sprayed down all my prints, uh, did one coat going horizontally, another coat going uh, 90 degrees to it so you get a good even coat. And uh, real easy to apply, but that's a good way to protect your, uh, your Polaroid prints or your, um, your peel apart prints after you've exposed them. Um, so that's a few, uh, few simple tips here, but I really wanna talk about uh, why the prints came out the way they did. In other words, why they didn't come out as good as I hoped. So for everyone that chimed in on the comments explaining why they thought the prints didn't come out well, there was a definite consensus. Pretty much everyone agreed. When it comes to this Polaroid peel apart film, the, uh, you can't get a proper exposure on both. If you expose properly for the negative, the print will not look good and vice versa. So you have to decide which one's more important, properly expose for that, and then throw out the other. 
You can think of it as the print and the negative essentially have different ISO ratings, different exposure indexes. So a proper exposure for one is not a proper exposure for the other. That's what everybody said. It made sense because uh, Ansel Adams even said as much about Polaroid peel apart film. And everyone would be right if it was Polaroid. Uh, the old Polaroid film did work that way. And you know, it's easy to think of New 55 as just Polaroid film, but it's not. It's a new thing. It's a separate thing. A lot of the chemicals and chemistry that uh, they used in Polaroid, you can't use anymore. It's illegal because of environmental hazards, or it's just too hard to get, it's too expensive, whatever. New 55 is a new formulation, it's all brand new stuff, so it's technically a different film entirely. Of course, it's based on Polaroid technology, but it's its own thing. So Polaroid film, yes, you had to expose for one or the other, and then throw out whichever one uh, you didn't expose for. But after doing some research, and talking to Sam at New 55, I discovered that New 55 handled that problem. They fixed that problem. With New 55, you don't need to expose for one or the other. You can get a proper exposure on both. With careful metering and uh, knowing how this stuff works, it's totally possible. Now you might be thinking, well, of course Sam told you that. He works at New 55 and he's gonna hype it up because he wants to sell film. Fair enough, but I tested it out myself and he's right. The print and the film are not, they don't require completely different metering. They don't require completely different exposures. But that's a really cool thing about New 55. You can get a great print and a great negative. So then that brings us to why did my prints come out so poorly? Now to understand this, it helps to understand how the prints are made in the first place. Now, if you're very familiar with Polaroid film, you can probably skip past this. You probably know how the prints are made. But this was actually news to me, and I wish I had known this, I wish I had researched this before I went out, because it would have completely made sense to me why my prints were coming out the way they were. So, let me explain how the prints are actually made. Now, New 55 is composed of a negative and a print, of course. Now, the print is just plain white paper until you run the developer process. So think of it as just plain white paper and a standard garden variety negative. Uh, it's kind of just a normal black and white negative. It behaves like any other black and white negative. So the negative, like any other film, is simply composed of a base layer, which is the plastic part of it, the polyester part of it. That's the main body of the film. And on top of it is a very thin layer of emulsion. Emulsion is the silver halide chemistry that creates the image. So that silver halide works in such a way that when the parts of the emulsion that see light, silver halide remains on the film once it's developed. But the parts of the emulsion that did not receive light, that silver gets washed off the film in the developing process. And so the shadows basically become clear film or close to clear film whereas the highlights are dense uh, film with a lot of buildup of silver. So that's how all print film works. That's how all negatives work. So on New 55, it's no different, except that we're throwing a print into the mix. And when you understand how the print is made, it's actually fascinating. When I learned how the print is made, I was like, that's freaking genius. Like, I know I'm a Johnny come lately to this, but the whole concept of peel apart prints like this, it's genius. It's fascinating how they're actually made. So here's how it works. Normally you would have this negative and all of the silver halide from the shadows would just get washed away in the developer chemicals and thrown out. That's normally how it goes with film. But, you know, why not use that silver halide, transfer it to a print, and then you have yourself a positive. So that's actually how it works. The, the film, remember it's recorded upside down, so it'd be like this. So the film on New 55, uh, it's in there, uh, here we go, like this. You pull the dark slide out, you have this uh, virgin film, it hasn't been exposed yet. You expose it to your image, um, and then you put the dark slide back down, and that print goes in front of the negative. Then you pull the whole thing through to the developer. It spreads the developer chemicals across the negative and the print. And the negative is developed just like normal. 
silver halide builds up in the highlights and then it gets washed away on the shadows. Except this time, it doesn't get washed away. It gets transferred to the print. So all of the silver halide that was not being utilized in the shadows becomes ink on this paper. Quote unquote ink, of course it's not actually ink, it's just silver halide. But it's getting transferred to the paper and it's behaving as ink on the white paper. And so all of the highlights in the negative don't give up any silver halide to the print. But all of the shadows, because they're not gonna use that silver halide, that all gets transferred to the print. And the result is, you get a positive image. I don't know about you, but I think that's fascinating. That's such a cool technology. That silver halide's not going to waste. It's being turned into quote unquote ink on this print. So that brings us to why my prints were not coming out quite like I hoped. Um, so when I exposed the negative on New 55 film, uh, I was exposing the negative like I expose any other black and white negative, which is, I tend to prefer high contrast uh, black and white negatives. In other words, I like to really push the dynamic range hard. I like my highlights to be bright, crisp, dense highlights, and I like my shadows to be deep, dark, thin shadows. And that's just a personal preference thing. I like the high contrast look. That's why I often push my black and white film to get a little more contrast, and I often use a red filter to push that contrast even harder. And that works fine for the negative. You'll actually see from the video, the negatives all came out great. So that technique did work just fine for the new 55 negatives. But because I didn't understand the whole transfer of silver halide from the negative to the print, um, I didn't realize I was kind of getting myself into trouble shooting that way. And another thing that was causing some issues is I tend to lean for denser negatives, um, which is common practice. That's, that's pretty well known amongst the photography community. And if you've done my, uh, my online course, Master Manual Metering for Film Photography, uh, you know that a denser negative is better than a thinner negative. Um, which, just quick side note, that does not mean you should overexpose all your pictures. It drives me nuts that that's such a prevalent bit of wrong information. Don't overexpose all your pictures. That's not what the advice uh, is telling you to do. It's just saying that you're better off with a slightly denser negative than a negative that's too thin. Because a dense negative you can still work with, there's detail there. But a thin negative, uh, you really can't pull more detail out of it. Um, anyway, so when shooting uh, print film like this, I tend to lean for denser negatives. Uh, highlights are nice and crisp and bright. Um, if you're shooting the zone system, that'd be like putting the highlights at zone uh, 8, 9, or 10. If you're doing my metering technique, that'd be like putting your highlights at plus 3, plus 3.5, plus 4, something like that. So you're putting the highlights at the upper end of the dynamic range uh, that the film can handle. And that's normally good practice. You get nice, dense highlights. You can work with that in the scan or in the darkroom, and that's totally fine for the negative. But if you think about it, that's going to leave no silver halide to transfer to the print. There's no silver halide left over because the negative is eating it all up in those bright, crisp highlights. And that's fine for the negative, but you get a print where there was no silver halide available in the highlights for it to utilize. And so that's what I was running into. Now you might be thinking, I'm basically saying I'm gonna meter darker, but it's not that simple. Uh, it's a holistic view. I'm basically gonna be keeping in mind that I'm not only exposing a negative, I'm exposing a positive. So I want a negative that's not too thin, but I also want a print that's not too thin. So I need to walk that fine line uh, where the exposure gives me enough density on the negative and enough density on the print to get good results on both. And it's totally possible, you just have to be careful with your metering and take kind of a holistic view of uh, how your tonalities are gonna be rendered on the negative and on the print. And so basically what I'm gonna do going forward is for one, I'm not gonna push the contrast so hard because although that might be fine for the negative, uh, it's not so good for the print. Um, so I probably won't be using my red filter as much unless it's a really low contrast scene to begin with. Um, and if I'm shooting really high contrast light, I'm gonna be cognizant of that as I'm doing my metering. And so I'm gonna make sure my highlights generally aren't above 
maybe two stops above middle tone, so like a plus two on my metering process. If you're doing the zone system, it'd be like a zone seven. Um, I'm gonna make sure my highlights generally don't go above that if I want it to transfer to the print properly. Um, now, of course, this is gonna result in a little bit thinner negatives, but Sam at New 55 assured me, you'll be surprised how thin the negative can be and still get a good scan from it on this New 55 film. Um, and by God, he was right. So I tested it out uh, and I got pretty damn good results. So that's actually why this camera's here. This is an old Brownie, um, Kodak Brownie from the early 1900s. And I decided, you know what? I'd like to photograph that bad boy on new 55. Um, you know, test run, practice to uh, apply my newfound knowledge about how this film works and how to adjust my metering process. So I went down to my garage and uh, just use the beautiful, big, soft light pouring in from the open garage. That's great light, by the way. I placed the camera on a piece of glass, uh, elevated above the garage floor so that the garage floor would go out of focus a little bit. Um, and then I exposed uh, two frames, front view and side view, on new 55 film. And then I eagerly came back up to my dining room to develop the results. Now I'm happy to say, the print came out perfectly. It's beautiful. The prints came out like everything I ever hoped New 55 prints would. They're so cool looking. They got character, they got vibe, they got some grunginess to it, but excellent tonalities. And that's because I was so much more careful about my metering. I was keeping in mind, if I put this tone here on the scale, how much silver halide is that gonna leave to transfer to the print? You know, I was, I was really factoring the print in to my metering process and my exposure. And the result is two gorgeous looking prints. I was so happy to see these things come out. Um, it's everything I hoped for in terms of these prints. Now you might be thinking, well, what about the negative? Did you sacrifice the negative in getting these great prints? Now I will say the print, the excuse me, the negative is thinner than I would normally be comfortable with. It is a little bit thinner, but still, they scanned beautifully. They came out great. So, turns out I can go with a little bit thinner negative so that I can get a better print and I don't have to worry about it screwing up my scans or prints or whatever. So, there you go, there's your proof. It's totally possible to get a great print and a great negative with careful metering. Now, of course, I don't wanna to go too thin. Um, I don't wanna underexpose these pictures. I wanna get a good solid exposure for the negative and a good solid exposure for the print. It's just that I have to be a little more careful than if I'm only shooting negatives. You know, if I only care about the negative, I can err on the side of dense, no problem. And, and I can fix that in the scan if it's too bright or fix it in the dark room if I'm doing dark room printing. Um, but if I'm factoring in a print, I gotta keep both in mind. Now just quick side note, um, when I took these pictures, I knew the reflections on the glass were gonna be a problem. Uh, I didn't have a bunch of dark cloth and everything to mask it out. And I was just doing, for, doing this for the sake of practice. But if I were to do this again, I definitely want to uh, get rid of those reflections on the glass because uh, I find them a little distracting. But in this case, I actually prefer the prints over the negatives. Um, I really like them. Granted, they're not as sharp. The negatives are tack sharp. Uh, I've actually, I'm actually very impressed with the sharpness of this new 55 film. The prints, of course, are not gonna be as sharp, um, but still, they look, uh, they look pretty awesome. So, I'm feeling real good about new 55 now. I feel like I can expose it for a good negative and a good print, and that's, um, that's lighting a fire under my ass, man. I really wanna expose more of this. And so, over the past couple weeks, I've been, um, pre-visualizing a triptych I really want to do. I've been mulling it over and it's been slowly developing over the weeks and I finally got it to where I want and I'm picturing the three prints on the wall and uh, it's gotta be done on New 55. It's gonna happen. I just gotta get all the parts together. It requires a few props. Um, it's gonna be in the studio, not on location. Uh, I will be doing a video on it, so you'll see it. But now I'm jazzed, man. I'm jazzed. I got good results. I can repeat them, I think. And um, now I got a new tool in my repertoire. I got a new film I can go to when I want that 
peel apart film look. So there you have it. It's everything I've learned about new 55 film. I can't wait to expose more of it. So go out and get yourself some new 55 if you're so inclined. It is a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, I know it's not cheap, but I think it's worth it. But more than that, go out and get yourself some Willet Straight Rye Whiskey, aged four years. I think you'll be glad you did. Thanks for watching, and until next time, cheers. Thank you.